What's going on, everybody? It's Dr. Chris Featherstone here for yet another episode of Unscripted. It's Tuesday night. You know what that means, ladies and gentlemen. I have some of the biggest, the baddest, the best wrestlers of today and yesteryear. And this night is no different, ladies and gentlemen. Look, people know that uh, I've been a wrestling fan for over 35 years now. And back in the late 90s, this guy really... Uh, he really caught my attention, all right, because he was full of zest. He was full of energy, ladies and gentlemen. He was like a big, raging, handsome Cajun, ladies and gentlemen. As a matter, as a matter of fact, he was uh, not only a corporal Cajun, he was a Lash LaRue, and he called himself, if I'm not mistaken, he called himself the I Atola of Shrimp Criola, if I'm not mistaken. And he would have a, a saying, laissez le bon temps rouler, and actually, uh, pro, je parle français, it actually means let the good times roll. Ladies and gentlemen, former WCW Tag Team Champion, Lash, Lou, how are you tonight, my man? Man, I'm tremendous. What a great opening, man. I couldn't ask for a better introduction. Everything but the sideburns are here with us tonight. I feel like a star from yesteryear, dare I say so. Yes, yes, indeed, man. You are a star from yesteryear, man. It's, it's great to have you on the show tonight, my man. Hey, thanks for having me, man. I love that term, by the way. We need to bring that back single-handedly yesteryear. That's phenomenal. Yes. <laughs> thank you thank you man i want to be i, I want to be the superstar that. from yesteryear yes yes i use that uh i use that term every uh every week because i love the people i bring on the show because hey you know what you might not be like the the latest aw buzz or anything like that but you know what you were a former wcw tag team champion in the 90s and so yeah i mean yesteryear is uh you know like yesteryear is five years ago 15 years ago you pick your yesteryear whatever it is man <laughs> hey i love it there's no shame in it whatsoever it's a great business just to be a part of it is a tremendous privilege to leave any kind of footprint whatsoever no matter how faint no matter how small no matter how large no matter how big is just in and of itself a great accomplishment so to be mentioned in in the same vein of a lot of the stars that you throw out there, it's extremely humbling and and I wear with uh with pride and humility simultaneously. Man, that's awesome, man. It's a you know it, it is a it is a real thing. I'm not just blowing smoke, man. I remember back in the day, 
uh, when I was a big fan of WCW, I watch it every week, and uh, I would watch it during the Monday Night Roar, uh, Monday Night Wars, and you were part of the Misfits in action. If I'm not mistaken, you won the, the tag team titles with Lieutenant Loco, right? With Chavo Guerrero, right? Absolutely. And, Absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, and I, I remember I popped for that because I was all for it. Was I don't know? It was something about uh, you won that in 2000, right? Late two thousand, yes, Australia. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's so. right. We were in Australia. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I remember I popped for that man because it was like it was a an opportunity for you to really kind of add another layer to your character, and the misfits and action man, it, it worked out for you, man. It, it got you a got you a title, man. So that was that was pretty cool. Well, to be completely honest about it as well, Chris, one of the things that we wore with, with extreme pride on that was when that gimmick was brought to us as a collective group, we were all friends already. We were all buddies. We'd all traveled on the road together. We would train together. We would eat together. So we were close, and we considered ourselves family already. But what brought us together was when Vince Russo came in, he said, look, I'm looking at you guys, and I'm seeing some very talented guys in I've got two choices. I either don't have anything for you on television, can't really use you, and have to send you home, or maybe we put you guys together in a stable. And if you remember, when we first started, we started with Booker T as well. He brought back an old gimmick, GI Bro, which yeah. is still tremendously underrated, if you ask me. But uh, anyway, they threw us all together, man, and they literally sold it to us this way. You know, Vince Russo said, Bro, have you ever seen the movie Stripes? You're going to be the movie Stripes. And the idea being that every show needs some comic relief. And we were cool with that. We didn't have a problem with that. We were just happy to wear some jerseys on the team. You know what I mean? But uh, what we were able to do with that then is it's a testament, I think, to the work ethic and the working ability of the guys that were in that stable to be able to get it over to the level that we got it over. That We went from just being comic relief and, and fodder for good ratings, hopefully on television, to suddenly you have uh, you know Hugh Morris having a run with the United States title, and then you have uh, Chavo and I having the tag team titles. You have Booker T, who very quickly, obviously, evolved right out of that group and into the world title picture. Mm -hmm. So I think it says a lot about the talent that was stuck in that group together that we sort of rose above just some silly typecasting into being some viable candidates for some real action. Absolutely. Uh, good Vince Russo impersonation. Uh, I actually have uh, two uh, as of right now. It's about to, we're about to announce uh, something else coming soon, but as of right now, this show, I have two shows with Vince Russo, including uh, uh, the post raw show that we have called the Legion of Raw, and I, I, I uh, have learned to to know very to know Vince Russo very well and to become good friends with them. And it's it's funny that you say that because we talk every week and we we have multiple shows together. And he always was a big fan. He always talks about this a lot. He talks about how he's a big fan of trying to make something out of whoever's on the talent roster giving them some airtime and really spending time to invest in each and every one of them. And I, and it's, it's interesting because you said that that is definitely something that Vince Russo would do. He'll look at the roster. He talks about this all the time. He looked at the roster. He said, man, like either I'm not going to use you. You got to go home. or I'm going to figure something out with you. And, and I'm glad that he did that with you. Well, I, you know, I'll say this about Vince Russo. And there's two different schools of thought. And I'm not saying one is better than the other. Or one is right. And one is wrong. You have two different schools of thought, and Vince came in, Vince Russo came in and uh, immediately decided, look, if you are on the card, if you are part of this show, you're going to have some kind of storyline to drive that character and keep it going, right? And and that's a mentality. That's a way of writing a show, and, and again, it, it got tremendous results in and of itself. Another way of, of putting on a wrestling show is what we were before Vince Russo came in, which was if you were on the undercard, mid-card or lower, you probably didn't have a storyline. If you did, it was a small issue, and it was more or less you're booked in matches. Literally, you're not written into a storyline. You're booked in a matches, expected to go out and have a good match and let the match tell the story. You know, one's just one philosophy and one is another philosophy. Again, not saying that I ascribe 
to one particular method of thinking over the other. Uh, I will say this, one of the things that was extremely gratifying for me and, and helped me have a different perspective on the business and, and gave me a different outlook was Vince Russo was the first person I ever worked with on level that walked in and sat down with me and said, okay, here's some ideas we have going forward mm. uh, as opposed to just putting me in matches. And yeah. that, that helped me learn you know, creatively how to navigate the waters of who is Lash LaRue. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Awesome, man. You ready to dive into these questions? Sure, absolutely. Lay it on me. Oh, awesome, man. NWO Roy is uh, starting off with uh, last. Not many people knew that you, after you retired from wrestling, you became a pastor. What's that experience been like, and what has been the atmosphere like when you joined uh, WWE? All right, I will take those uh those are really two separate questions, so I'll, I'll handle them a little separately. Um, retiring from wrestling and then transitioning into a pastor is is strange in the sense that, on the one hand, it was extremely natural, and on the other hand, it was extremely impulsive. And, and what I mean by that is, from the wrestling standpoint, I kind of felt the writing on the wall for a while there. there there's almost like you feel your days become numbered. Or you lose a little bit of your passion for the business. And that generally will coincide with sort of a downtrend for yourself physically. You start feeling the injuries a little bit more. You, you care less about your work. That's not good. And that's not a healthy place to be. But uh, again, perspective with a little bit of age allows me to look back and say, I, I can recognize that's exactly where I was. And I was a little disheartened with the with where the business was and where my place was in the business. And I can remember very distinctly, I was on a show, a little local independent wrestling show in a small town called Pell City, Alabama, not too far from where I live now. And Bull Buchanan was on the show with me. And Bull Buchanan and I were the main event. And uh, recognizing that my head wasn't in the right place, recognizing that I didn't have the passion for the business that I once had, I realized I could have a very, very, very good match with Bull Buchanan, that there's no reason why we wouldn't go out and just tear the, the house down. And I walked in, looked at him, and I said, uh, Barry, I'm retired, man. You're my last match. Tonight's my, my final match. Wow. And he goes, okay, sure. I said, Let's just go out there and have a good match. And he, he, I don't think he really took it seriously at the time. We went in, had a match uh, at the end of the match. I, I couldn't even tell you what the finish was. I don't remember how we ended the match. I just rolled out, and I was done. I didn't cut a promo. I didn't announce my retirement. I didn't make a big deal out of it. Uh, sold my boots on eBay, and uh, the rest is history. I never walked back into a wrestling ring after that until about a year and a half ago. Uh, mm -hmm. I guess more like two years ago, uh, Arn Anderson came and worked a workshop for some local wrestlers, and I knew he was in town. I popped in just to see him, uh, slid into the ring and talked to him and wanted to thank him for being so influential and so good to me in WCW. And mm -hmm. Bull happened to be there because he's got a son that's breaking into the wrestling business that's extremely talented. Mm -hmm. And uh, he mm -hmm. saw me and ah, she was up at folks being, of course, I come up to about his chest and like a little fifth grade kid. And he <laughs> goes, man, where you been? I haven't seen you in about 10 years. And I go, that's because I retired. He goes, I thought you were rid of me. <laughs> like, no, I wouldn't be you. So that's, that was kind of my four-way coming out of the wrestling business as far as going into ministry. Uh, look, nobody's perfect. Nobody walks uh, an absolutely 100% spotless testimony, but I tried to. And I've been a believer, and I've been a Christian since I was nine years old. And uh, I carried that with me, carried that faith with me throughout my time in wrestling. And because of the profile that I had in professional wrestling, I'd be asked to speak in a lot of church groups, a lot of civic clubs, youth ministries, things of that nature. And I would give my testimony because I had this real dramatic story of where I had come from and, and where I was and how God had blessed me through it all. But I quickly recognized and realized that everyone has a story. That everybody does. It's just some sound more dramatic than the other. But there, believe me, there's no story more dramatic than the one you've lived yourself, right? right. So... Rapidly, my testimony transitioned from just me talking about myself to talking with people to then sharing the word and preaching and teaching and offering any ministerial advice I possibly could and help. And so it was 
transition for me when I came out of wrestling. I went into uh, ministry because simultaneously, a gentleman that was like a brother to me, a mentor and a teacher, was my youth pastor when I was nine years old, who was about uh, 12 years my senior. Just as I was retiring from wrestling, he was coming out of seminary. And he took first pastorate. And he asked me if he became the pastor of this church, would I be willing to come in as a youth pastor? And I agreed to that. And we've been tethered at the hip since then. I'm, I'm the associate pastor where he is the senior pastor now at, at our local church. Very nice, man. You still in Alabama? I'm still in Alabama, man. I'm the associate uh, pastor of uh, First Baptist Church at McClellan. And that's in Aniston, Alabama. And I'm also... Uh, the chaplain for Legacy Villages, which is an assisted living facility in Jacksonville, Alabama. And uh, I draw funny pictures for a living, man. That's where I make all my money. It allows me to do ministry. You know, That's awesome, man. I love it. So yeah. what was the atmosphere like when you joined WWE? Oh, yeah. Thank you. I almost forgot the second part there. It was different. It was strange. Uh, I won't sugarcoat it uh, again, though perspective and experience of being a little further down the road, you can look at those things and the reality that was taking place differently, uh, you know, now with me being 24 than I did when I was then in my early 20s. Uh, all you know when you're in your early 20s is, hey, what happened? What do I have to do to get another spot, you know, or what do I have to do to keep a job or why am I being treated this way or that way? At the time, my perspective was, Man, everybody talks about how political WCW was, but this feels far more political to me. And mm. everyone talks about how WCW feels corporate and WWE feels like a family, but it felt the exact opposite to me. I always felt welcome. It felt like a part of the family in, in, in WCW. Not always so in WWE when I first started. And at the time, those are things that, that you have a tendency to internalize and take personally. Uh, being older and just looking at business from a 30,000 foot perspective, you know, like in an airplane and looking down and, and seeing the entire landscape and looking at the history and the timeline, you can really go back and look how many people they have under contract at the time that had world champions that weren't being used and didn't have a spot. Yes. You know, how many guys were top guys? They, they, they had acquired all this talent, man, and didn't have space for all of them. And, and for me, I thought that, is something personal or that it had to do with as a human being or as a worker. It's just the wrong perspective to have it. I, I chalk it up to being young, being inexperienced. If I walked into that same environment now, I may not walk out of there with, with a high profile job and I may not walk out of there being used week in and week out, but I guarantee you I'd walk out of there with friends and with colleagues and with very good working relationships with everybody I came in contact with. Very nice. Yeah. So if you had an opportunity back then when you went to WWE, if you had an opportunity to pitch something to Vince McMahon, what would it have been? I always thought that the raging caging gimmick in and of itself was a strong gimmick and that never really had a chance to be completely uh, flushed out. And what I mean by that is I really believe – that there was a lot left on the mind, so to speak, you know, like th the things we never did in WCW that I would have pitched to Vince McMahon that we would do is, is to take that to a little bit, turn up the volume on the Raging Cajun a little bit, not really tweak or change the gimmick so much as to come out there being, you know, the Raging Cajun, Lash LaRue, the Stooge from Baton Rouge, what you mentioned, the Ayatollah of Shrimp Creola, the guy that came down Bourbon Street and is riding the floats on Mardi Gras, you know, because I was so accepted, man, in New Orleans. I, I was Grand Marshal, along with some other WCW guys, uh, of Marty three years in a row while we were, you know, in WCW. And, man, it's, if you – and WCW did this, to their credit, the last year, right before the business was, uh, was sold, and it never really had a chance to be used. But if you had footage – of me being the Grand Marshal at Mardi Gras, throwing out Mardi Gras beads. If you took that whole Mardi Gras carnival atmosphere and you had a way to put that into an entrance and bring it to the ring, there's a lot to be used there. There's a lot of meat on that bone. The same way you mix into that some of the old Gambit Marvel comic character. Uh, along with that, you can throw in a, a nice, healthy mix what a lot of people aren't aware of. There's a whole culture 
around Swamp Pop, which is like rock music from the 70s that has that little Wayne Barr, you know, uh, distorted guitar sound to it mm-hmm. That mm-hmm. while still having some swamp. Man, uh, there's so much rich culture there just in Louisiana in general and then in Cajun specifically that sky's the limit on what you could have done with that character, man. And, right. and I, I, yeah. I love it. Your finisher should have been called the Gumbo Driver. The Gumbo Driver. How about that? Why did I not think of that? <laughs> Instead of the whiplash. Yes, the Gumbo Driver, man. There you go. But, you know, you're uh, talking about moves. I'll tell you a quick story if you have to yeah. hear it. Um, yeah. If you remember talking about the, the Cajun character there, I had sort of the signature move called the Bourbon Street Blues. Mm-hmm. And the Bourbon Street Blues started completely by accident. And we were just outing around at the power plant one day and a lot of the guys would come down there and train and just try some new things and get in the ring and just work out and page was down there Diamond Dallas page was down there chris canyon was down there for the guys for disco uh, mike sanders alan funk a lot of these uh power plant guys and we were just working out in the ring and i was always goofing off and trying to make jokes and pop people and make them laughing and at the time the rock had just started doing his you know big people's elbow and you had uh road dog was doing the shimmy shake and then you had uh uh you had scotty too hottie doing his deal with the worm right the worm, yeah. yeah and so i came out and i said look uh i told page and i acted serious but i was being i was being go look this is the idea that i've got page this is what i'm gonna start doing in the match bro i'm gonna i'm gonna punch the guy i'm gonna jab him three times and then i'm gonna dance like james brown do the splits, pop up and close line him. And I'm laughing while I'm walking through this and doing it in front of him. And he just stops and looks at me. And I, I give him complete credit for it, man. He goes, bro, you've got to do that in every match. <laughs> and I did, and it got over it. You yeah, know, it so yeah, I remember that. Yeah, it, was, it was cool. That is cool. Uh, all right, so um, here we go couple two another two-parter uh what do you consider the most about being uh, a cartoonist since not many people know this about you and what was the feud that you most wanted to have in wcw but didn't get the chance to another two-parter oh man let's see uh okay well first of all the, the, what i would consider the most about being a cartoonist that people didn't know about me um I don't know if he's left a word out on most there, but the thing that's most rewarding about it for me is I just got, man, I get to draw funny pictures. I get to create something on the fly, and especially the way that I do it now. I was always a, a perfectionist uh, by nature, and I would get in and slave over a cartoon. When I did the lashing out cartoons for WCW Magazine, and then later on for Pro Wrestling Illustrated and for The Wrestler, man, I'd spend 16 hours on, on a cartoon that really was I'm not going to get paid that much for, and it's not getting a whole lot of print space, man, but it had to be perfect for me to sign off on it or what I considered perfect at the time as far as what my abilities were. And where I make the majority of my money now is, believe it or not, I'm I'm accepting bookings again. (laughs) You know, I felt a little bit like a wrestler from the standpoint of uh, I get booked out. I have maybe uh, a dozen different companies that book me out to do live caricature events. So, like, if you go to Six Flags or a theme park and you see the little booth and the guy's drawing the quick cartoon caricature portraits of people in about six minutes, well, I get booked out to do these at private corporate events and uh, I do college campuses. I just did a college campus today in North Georgia, as a matter of fact. I was nice. there for five yeah. hours. Yeah. And so, you, in the nature of that beast, I mentioned it because the nature of that is you have to be fast because there's a line going constantly. You can't be a perfectionist. So it's really rewarding for me to have to go with my first gut instinct to trust myself that it's going to be good enough that my, that it it may not be my absolute best, but it's going to be better than most. And it's going to be way above average. And it's going to be a great drawing that somebody's going to enjoy. And I can knock it out that quickly. It's extremely rewarding. And uh, I'll give you a little bonus side to that story. The way that I got into doing that professionally in the first place, it was always a hobby for me. I always, enjoyed drawing uh exaggerated portraits of people which is what a caricature is Mm -hmm. and we would do a lot of these shows that we'd have to be in the building at noon for a show doesn't go live until 7 p.m right nitro Mm -hmm. thunder some of those 
And I would start carrying dry erase markers with me in my bag, and I would draw on the boards in the back locker room. And Kurt Henning saw me doing that once. And Kurt Henning, who was a notorious practical joker, he saw that, thought it was the greatest thing in the world, and it would entertain him to no end to sit there and go, Lash, 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 look, draw Hulk, draw Hulk. Uh, okay, so I'd start drawing Hogan. Now, draw him really, really, really old. I go, Man, come on, you're going to get me heat. No, I'll do it, do it. So I'd draw him really, really old. And he goes, now draw the Walker and oxygen mask. And I'm going, man, come on. He goes, I I'm like, he's in the other room. And he's like, look, he's not going to get mad. He's not going to, you tell him you don't write the news, you just report it. And that's still a line that I use now. You know? But uh, guys for the magazine saw that, and they saw me drawing the other wrestlers, and they thought it would be a really, really cool thing for me to do a cartoon for the magazine, that an actual wrestler was doing a cartoon in the magazine. And that's how Lashing Out was born. And um, to answer the second part of that question, probably the feud that I would have loved to have had in WCW that I never had a chance to would have been with Ray Mysterio Jr. Uh, Ooh, and I say that. that I say that because Ray and I never had a feud, but man, we must have had 20 or 30 matches. We counted all the house shows, non-televised events that we worked each other on. And we always had great chemistry, good matches. And we were very, we complimented one another in the sense that we could do things on the fly that was made up moves that nobody really caught, but it just seemed like the right thing to do at the right time. And we could both pull it off and trusted one another. So that was yeah. always awesome. That is cool. You mentioned Hogan. How was it working with Hogan in WCW? He was tremendous to me, man. I always thought that he was tremendous. Um, he was a superstar that deserved to be treated like a superstar. And, of course, I grew up being a big Hulk Hogan fan. So it was awesome to me to meet him, someone that I idolized when I was younger. But uh, even more so, I mean, he was always down to earth to me. He was always really cool to me, very good to me. In fact, he was interviewed one time in a magazine. And, um, and, and, you know, I probably took this more seriously than I should have, but he mentioned some of the up and coming guys, uh, and he mentioned by name, Billy Edmond and Lash LaRue. And man, that was one of the largest compliments I could have ever gotten in my life to just have thought that I was on his radar. And I went up to him the next time I saw him at a show and thanked him for, uh, going out of his way to mention me because it just carried so much weight with me. Uh, all of those guys in WCW were just tremendous to me. Yeah, that's awesome. Very nice. Very nice. Uh, all right, a few more. Um, let's see. Raju's asking, big fan from when I was a kid, do you think AEW could be the next WCW? Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, I'll be, I'll look, completely honest, all cards on the table, complete transparency. I've been away from the business for a very long time, so I haven't been dialed in. And part of the reason why I have not been dialed in is because you don't get into the wrestling business unless you are a wrestling fan in the first place, more often than not. You've got your few outliers, people that may have been a professional athlete in a different sport and they got roped in. But more often than not, the vast, vast, vast majority of professional wrestlers are people that grew up being fans themselves, right? So you have this inherent interest in what's going on. And I've been out of pocket when it comes to the wrestling business for over a decade because there was really nothing going on in the wrestling business that really grabbed my attention and, and kind of pulled me back in or started to be more fair about it, just started stirring those passions again. Mm -hmm. And I see AEW and it starts stirring those passions again. And, you know, maybe you chalk it up to nostalgia. Maybe it's mm -hmm. the being on the Turner brands and, and maybe yeah. it's the production value has this similar WCW feel to it. Or maybe it's yeah. seeing some of my old brothers and comrades going out there and doing what they're doing so well. Maybe it's the fact that even the generation that came after me, that's considered young than I am, like your CM Punks and those guys that are now making comebacks, Really, because I started in the business so young, there's not much of an age difference between the two yeah. of us. So maybe that yeah. fires me up and sparks me a little bit. But yeah. call it whatever you want to call it. What what gets my attention more than anything else, though, is first from a fan standpoint, just energy and interest. Man, you watch the, the their show and you flip on and you see the crowd. You can't fake that kind of enthusiasm. You just mm -hmm. can't. So the mm -hmm. hunger and the enthusiasm for something real and authentic and different is there. Uh, so that's a big, big part of it. They're obviously drawing. 
that's a huge part of it. The talent is there to drive to drive it. I mean, good, solid talent that are bona fide stars in and of themselves can drive that ship. And more importantly than I think anything else, at the top of it all, and I don't know Tony Khan. I'm not going to pretend that I've ever had even a conversation with him. But it seems to me you've got somebody with some very smart business genius and capabilities at the top who is more important than anything else spending his own money mm -hmm. because what gets a lot of wrestling companies in trouble is when they start being creative with somebody else's money because it's easy to be creative with somebody else's money you just spend until you run out of money and, and either the ratings in the business there or it's not but yeah. when you're spending your own money you have to really be judicial about where you put those dollars. So yeah, you want the most bang for your buck and, and they're getting a really big bang and they're spending a lot of bucks, but they are looking at it like it's an investment that better have a bottom line, more black than red involved in it. Or at the end of the day, everybody's going home, everybody's gonna be successful. That's right, precisely. Along those same lines, though, do you think Sting and Goldberg will still be wrestling in 2021? Uh, yeah. Did, did I think? Did I think that um, maybe not Goldberg so much as Sting, hmm. and and that's not a knock on Goldberg. I just I always saw Goldberg as being somebody that had a lot of talent and a lot of irons and a lot of different fires, you know. Hmm. And so he he would pursue other options, and Sting would too. Don't misunderstand me. Sting is a phenomenal guy. He's a Christian. And by the way, too, that, yes. that made it a point to pull me aside when I first came in the WCW and said, Lash, I know you're a believer and I know you're super young. And if you start running into any problems or temptations and you just need somebody to talk to, seek me out and I'd love to sit down and talk to you, which I, I thought was it. the coolest thing in the world. Yeah, because yeah, awesome. I, was, I was nobody at that point, you know, and that's the kind of guy that Sting is. Sting's a great actor, but at, at his heart, he's what I would always refer to in, in the wrestling business. You've got guys in the wrestling business that are lifers. You know, they will always be wrestlers. Rick Flair will always be a professional wrestler, no matter whether options come his way. Hulk Hogan has always been a professional wrestler. No matter where else he winds up landing, it's always based on who he is as a professional wrestler when he comes back to wrestling. A flip side of that is Rock could be a lifer. He chooses not to be. You know, he's got, he's got all the talent. And, and all the ability that he needs to make a, a, a full lifelong career in professional wrestling, but he's gone other ways. I, it would not have surprised me to have seen Goldberg do just that and, and stick with uh, doing the sitcom thing where he's on the Goldberg. He has done a phenomenal job on, uh, you know, and, and, and hosting the shows that he's hosted in the past. He, he yeah. found success with those things. So yeah. for him to come back to the wrestling business, by the way, I think has proven he has a passion for the business that he was never given credit for when he was younger and he should have been. Uh, yeah. Sting, Sting is just, man, he's one of those guys that'll be on the Mount Rushmore professional wrestling at the end of the day. Yeah. Sting's my all time favorite wrestler. So, but right. Sting uh, is Sting. It, you're not going to, you know, you just, you're not going to beat that. And, and that is somebody, too, by the way, I'll say this. It's obvious he's not doing it because, because he is, he's wasted a fortune. He's obviously not doing it because he hit rock bottom. And he's got to make that one more comeback to pay the mortgage. You know, right. Sting cares about the fans. He cares about the wrestling business, and he cares about helping younger guys. What yeah. more could you ask for out of a person than that? Yeah, and it's clear because, you know, he's basically the kind of player coach of Darby Allen right now. And he's, Absolutely. he's really like – I mean, he's <laughs> – Pushed Darby Allen's stock through the roof now. I mean, Darby Allen was over by himself, but with that sting rub, though, I mean, it's just a whole different level right now. And, and at the end of the day, you know, here's the Chris, here's the thing I asked about that. How does that help sting? I mean, maybe it helps him now being in the company and, and because what AEW has done and because Darby Allen's been able to run with the ball. But how did it help sting from the beginning? It did, it was just sting being unselfish. Yeah. Exactly. And, and of course, now, now it's a win-win for everybody because it's made Sting relevant again. And like you said, it brought Dar Darby Allen up to the forefront. But mm -hmm. in the beginning, Sting was just doing it because for Sting, that was the right thing to do. Correct. That's awesome. Yeah. Good stuff. Well, my man, uh, my man Christopher's uh he he's he's <laughs> my 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 uh suggestion became a hashtag, the gumbo driver. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> hey man, who does some good gumbo? 
<laughs> that's right man all right man well uh, i'm gonna be um i'm gonna i'm gonna respect your time and uh it, i want people to let you know about uh things you got going on any type of uh social media tags or anything to, to promote your stuff man well hey man i appreciate that a lot and it's kind of you to offer Chris, here's the truth. I've been a ghost on social media, like you know, and 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 give the, give the people a little bit of the uh, the backstage workings, if you will, or or what goes into making the sausage. But it took us a long time to hook up together for that very reason. And uh, I've done a few things since you and I have started talking, but not very many. I'm a ghost on social media. Uh, that may change sometime in the near future, but it hasn't for the last ten years. Uh, if anybody's ever interested in booking me uh when it comes to caricature and that sort of thing they can either email me directly i've i've still got the same email i used to publish my cartoons back in wcw and, and the lashing out cartoons it's easy it's lash wcw at aol.com that has not changed you can tell with the old aol handle AOL, yeah. and uh at aol and hey that's a rib either that's a shoot aol.com and then the other thing is they can go to the tuneheads.com and or just google you know, last through caricatures, and that will take you to the tune heads. That's a company that I'm a partner in, and we do caricature events, we do festivals, we do fairs, we do commission caricatures. I also do commissions. If someone wants to email me and they want to get prices on what it would cost for Lash Larue to draw a caricature of him that's printed poster size, we can do it. Very nice, very nice, and uh, that is the. That is the site for the tune heads. As a matter of fact, I'm about to put this in the comments too. So you can do anyone uh, who's live right now can just click on it and uh, hop right on there. Well, thank you. Last has been a pleasure, man. Thanks. I uh, appreciate you coming on the show tonight, man. Hey, man, it's my pleasure too. I hope maybe we were able to bring enough energy with us. I, I'll be full disclosure. I was up at 3 30 this morning, uh, getting ready to hit the road to head to North Georgia, draw caricatures all day. And, uh, that's the day that I've had all day long. So yeah, I'm winding yeah. it on down now. Yeah. Well, uh, I got to respect this super chat real quick. Uh, just, a, just a real quick answer. Memories from your time in HWA and Cincy. Uh, you know what? That was a difficult time. I'll say that. Uh, it was a difficult time because you had a lot of guys that weren't expected to be stuck in, and relegated back to a training facility again. That wasn't the promise that was made to them. And again, I don't blame the corporate people because of that. Uh, I don't. The The best thing that came out of that was I was able to meet and become friends with some of the guys that were coming up behind us that were more WWE guys than WCW guys. And uh, when, I, when I say that, I mean people like um, people like Charlie Haas. Okay. You know, yeah. he, he was down there at the time. Great guy. Great, phenomenal guy. Uh, I, re I remember we helped train and worked a little bit with, with, with Cena, Brock Lesnar, Randy Orton, and and Dave Batista all kind of came through at that exact same time, which was phenomenal. And they came through Louisville, but we were trading back and forth constantly and going back and forth. And uh, it was difficult for the WCW guys, man. And I won't be dishonest about that. I mean, uh, the reason why is because most of us, and, and I should speak for myself more than anybody else. I, I, I was brought in on a talent deal. And I was asked to go there for four weeks to knock the ring rust off till they were ready to bring me on television. Mm -hmm. And uh, 10 months later, man, I was still there and had to get an apartment there, was stuck there, uh, did not see a lot of the tunnel, did not have any clarity on what the yeah. idea was. Never had one WWE dark match the entire time I worked for the company. Not one dark match. But you were so, making money though, right? No, not really. Not uh, really and the reason really. why I say that, Chris, is th this is the reason why. It's because full disclosure, I took a $100,000 pay cut to go to WWE when they bought the company. I was called and I was told, uh, W the events, good news and bad news. That's the way Johnny Ace put it. Yeah. Last I got good, good news and I got bad news. The bad news is Vince is only interested in 24 guys from WCW. The good news is you're one. <laughs> so I just happened to be on the team. So I took a hundred thousand dollar pay cut to end up going to Cincinnati while working more than I was working in WCW, you know, wow. and you weren't getting any residual money because it wasn't considered WWE matches. Yeah. And uh, again, that's some of that stuff where you look back on 2020, you realize you were just lost in the mix. But at the yeah. time when you're living it and going through it, you're going, they just started this show called tough enough. And all these guys are staying in a mansion. 
Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, these are pay-per-views, and I'm sharing a a, a one-bedroom apartment with four of the wrestlers that have all been on TV before. Yeah. Well, you know, it it didn't. It, it was hard to make that compute. You know, mm -hmm. but what I got out of that was very close relationships with uh, Alan Funk, Jamie Noble, Mike Sanders. You know, guys that I was already close to anyway because of the power plant, especially Alan Funk and Mike Sanders. I was already close to from the power plant, but uh, mm -hmm. we solidified those bonds by going through all that stuff together. Yeah, good stuff, man. Thank you for sharing that. And uh, there's the link, y'all, uh, twohands.com uh, backslash last Larue. Man, thanks so much for being on the show tonight. I, I hope you had a good time. Hey, man, I did. Thank you for having me, man, and being so kind and being so generous. Awesome. Hey, by That's the way, I'm going let's have that ball tall, Rule. We'll let the good times roll. Hey. Have a good one. <laughs> <laughs> you too, brother. <laughs>